Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about the future of electronic musical instruments and composition. Musicians have always been looking for ways to innovate and improve instruments, whether it's Bach using the Well Temperament tuning system for pianos, as a better internal tuning for chord voicings, all the way to current Arduino microcontroller systems with complicated sensor inputs. Composers have experimented with different formats outside standard staff manuscripts like the 12-tone system created by Arnold Schoenberg or the indeterminate music systems made by John Cage. Musicians have always looked to expand their choices both sonically and compositionally. As computers have made possibilities virtually limitless, we'll also see modern trends of reintroducing limitations to both physical and virtual technology. To start, we'll need to take a trip down memory lane so we have a better understanding of where music technology has come from and how it informs current trends and practices. We'll also avoid strict chronological order, instead splitting the categories into hardware and software. The first notable electronic instrument was invented in 1897 by Thaddeus Cahill, called the Telharmonium. It weighed 200 tons and was driven by 12 steam-powered electromagnetic generators. It could be played in real time using velocity-sensitive keys, and amazingly enough, could also be polyphonic, meaning it could produce multiple voices. In 1919, Russian inventor Leon Theremin invented the monophonic theremin. It could be played without touching the instrument, making it seem like magic. It gauges the proximity of the user's hands through the disruption of electrostatic fields from the two antenna. It's a tremendously difficult instrument to master. Incidentally, Robert Moog, later famous for developing synthesizers in the 70s, started to build his own theremins at the age of 19. We'll get back to him in a bit. The term synthesizer was officially introduced in 1956 with RCA's Mark I, developed by engineers Harry Olson and Herbert Ballar. It used 12 tuning forks that were stimulated electromagnetically. It was pretty sophisticated for its time, allowing the recording of sound to two turntables. It was controlled by punching information into paper and feeding it into the computer system. Still, it was complicated to use and made real-time, spontaneous playing impossible. At the end of 1963, American inventor Robert Moog, or Bob Moog, combined a voltage-controlled oscillator and amplifier module with a keyboard. This was the first prototype of a modern synthesizer. Moog wouldn't actually call a system synthesizers until 1967. Moog continued to develop his modules as his work spread by word of mouth, propelled by the success of Wendy Carlos's LP Switched on Bach in 1968, one of the earliest multi-track recordings. Eventually other musicians caught wind and soon progressive rock bands like Rush or Yes as well as funk artists like Herbie Hancock were buying Moog synthesizers. On the other end of the spectrum, Donald Buchla, working independently, had a different vision. His synthesizers would be completely modular and developed in close cooperation with its users, most notably Morton Sabotnik, who recorded his infamous Silver Apples of the Moon with one of Buchla's first instruments, the Buchla Music Box Series 100. By design, Buchla's instruments catered more to academia and avant-garde musicians, so they never garnered the same public attention and acclaim that Moog's work did. Still, Buchla's vision of modular components that could be passed together was important to user-centered design, allowing musicians to modify their instrument on the fly to do all sorts of different signal processing. His ideas have exploded again onto the music scene in recent years, as we'll see later. The first contemporary and affordable synthesizer was Moog's Mini Moog Model D. It was compact and easy to use, unlike Buchla's mess of patch cords. This was a closed system, with all circuitry hardwired at the factory, but it simplified the manufacturing process, thus lowering the cost. It was a huge success. 13,000 Minimogs were sold worldwide up until 1981. But the Prophet 5 in 1978 would reveal itself to be the big boy synth of the generation, offering five voice polyphony and onboard memory, allowing users to save presets of their sounds. It's arguably the best sounding synthesizer of the time period. A few years prior to the Prophet 5, Peter Vogel and Kim Ryrie would approach synthesis in an entirely new way. The Fairlight CMI was friggin' amazing for its time. While the two inventors' original intent was to synthesize realistic acoustic sounds, the compromise of digital sampling would change music tech forever. The Fairlight isn't just a digital synthesizer. It's one of the earliest digital audio workstations. This thing is so ahead of its time, providing a graphical user interface with a pen device as an input and an integrated hard drive for storing audio information. It ran multiple applications like Page R, which allowed graphical real-time pattern sequencing. This would be the precursor to modern MIDI sequencing around a decade later. It would also be music at the same time to fit in with the whole thing. Right. So what the machine is loading now is the sounds of making tea. We've got first of all pouring water. Then we'll throw the spoon in. 
stir it around a bit. And, and you can play those sounds like a piece of music. Right, they're pitched to the keyboard. Or you can have them simultaneously. That's rather delightful. Now the machine... Computer music really started in 1957 with an inventor from Bell Labs named Max Matthews, who created the first sound generation from a computer with his music end systems. It ran only on university mainframes, but it could compute a triangle wave, and it could process it in real time. Max Matthews opened the era of digital musical sound. He started computer music and pursued it his whole life. He provided the initial research for programming languages for synthesis and composition, and also real-time performance with his Groove System and RTSKED, the first real-time event scheduler. We owe everything we have to his research. And now eight uh, grouplets. And two grouplets. The growing popularity of personal computers in the 80s would mark the introduction of integrated sound card systems, with the Passport Sound Chaser and Alpha Centauri being the first examples. The Apple II carried its own sound card, offering early music software for synthesis and sequencing. Going forward, companies like eMagic from Germany would use sound cards to make music workstation applications, the first called Creator, which was then followed by Notator, which ran on the Atari ST. Notator Logic was launched for Atari, Mac, and PC in 1992. In 2002, Apple would buy the software and rename it Logic, which is still widely used today. Alternatively, Pro Tools for PC would come around the same time in 1992. Seemingly overnight, the limitations of tape tracking would explode to virtually limitless amounts of tracks for recording. Pro Tools could host virtual instruments and effects. It could automate parameters, eliminating the all-hands-on-deck approach to production. It could also edit audio and MIDI sequencing, all within the box. Fun fact, the first major single produced by Pro Tools is Live in La Vida Loca by Ricky Martin. The early 2000s would also see the introduction of Unterras' auto-tune, hitting the mainstream which shares Believe. It became the stylistic effect of the decade, for better or worse. In the mid-1980s, Miller Puckett would develop Max, named after Max Matthews, for the Macintosh. It was first released commercially in 1990. Max and its sister software Pure Data would be an open-source, higher-level object-based programming language for everything like MIDI programs, audio granular synthesis, video and graphics programming, making web requests, and interfacing with microcontrollers like the Arduino. Max is essentially a suite of different processes, consisting of five parts. Max, which patches numbers and events or creates user interfaces. MSP, for patching audio signals. Jitter, for video graphics. Gen, which will compile your patch back into code for integration with hardware. And Max for Live, which integrates with the DAW Ableton Live, allowing Max to actually run inside an audio workstation. Max is not an audio editing program like Pro Tools or Logic. It really doesn't do anything unless you build something. But with that, you can build a dynamic process, an instrument if you will, which has its own merits outside making a static recording. Max gives the user the ability to create virtually anything out of chunks of code, and has revolutionized music technology through its open nature. On a side note, MIT's C-Sound and the open source Super Collider also offer text-based languages for signal processing, still used today by creators, sometimes in tandem by creating external applications that can run inside Max or even a browser. The first project was designed to get acquainted with building not only synthesizers, but also interactive user interfaces to control them, all with Super Collider code. Advances in affordable microcontrollers like the Arduino and Raspberry Pi have launched a revolution in open source digital instruments and controllerism. In my opinion, the most influential controller has been Brian Crabtree's Monom. Its concept is simple. Divorce the LED light operation of the input of pressing a button. Like the software Max MSP in a way, the Monom is just a slab of buttons until you plug it into a computer. However, it can become all sorts of different controllers through programming it. Even the schematics for the Monom are open source and you could build one yourself if you're willing to solder 128 LEDs to a board. Like the fate of all good inventions, eventually corporate entities catch wind and market cheaper, user-friendly products, albeit entirely closed systems. Controllers from Novation and Akai are built from the Monom concept, but they sacrifice customization for the ease of use. 
Recently, Crabtree has been focused on creating modular synth equipment closer to the traditions of Buchla, like ISMS, which is described as an extensible electronic instrument and composition system encompassing generalized practices and inter-ideological patterns, whatever that means. Other maker-centric companies like Adafruit also provide the materials to build your own modem-like devices on the cheap. The Ardu Touch is a special Arduino clone specifically manufactured for music. It has a PCB touch keyboard and buttons already installed. It even has a little speaker in it, all for around $30. It can be programmed to be a custom synthesizer, controller, or combination of the two, and there's already plenty of programs on GitHub to run on it. As you'll keep noticing, miniaturization and customization are central to the current and future trends of music tech. The Bella and Bella Mini are like tiny sound processors that fit in the palm of your hand, but with ultra low latency audio processing. They can be used for everything from instrument augmentation, wearables, installations, or custom interfaces. They're currently a bit pricey, but they have the potential to create custom integrated systems for all sorts of musical devices. This technology, as well as kinetic sculptures, research experiments, and teaching tools. With Bella Mini, we've condensed our original design to contain Bella's most popular and essential features. The result is a board that's one third of the size. Built on the new Pocket Beagle, Bella Mini is completely compatible with all the great software features of the original board, like the browser-based IDE and oscilloscope, the support for many different coding languages, the high resolution and low latency performance of the audio and sensor processing, and the ease with which you can make projects embedded and portable. On the semi-closed system side, devices like the Sensei Morph offer modular, pressure-sensitive controllers with an open API. It can transform into all sorts of different inputs. You can even 3D print your own overlays for it. And with the affordability of all sorts of sensors and microprocessors comes innovations like the Mimu gloves, which are an open source project you could build yourself today. They use Wi-Fi and open sound control to interface with software. The inputs from the glove sensors can be mapped to virtually any parameter inside the software of your choice. Plus, Emotion Heap uses them, so there's some extra cool brownie points there as well. The scale, like going up and down, down there, goes down a fifth, um, or down a fourth. Um, and then I can change the filter like that, and I can go between different sounds by going up and down using the pitch. This is what we call pitch. This is what we call yaw. This is what we call roll. And here, filtering the sound and kind of pitch bending it. And then stopping the arpeggiator and starting it again. Even Google has thrown their hat into the music tech ring with the N-Synth, a synthesizer utilizing machine learning for its sound design. It uses neural networks to generate sounds at the level of individual samples, for when you want to play music but you don't want to spend the next few hours picking the right preset from your software instrument library, or maybe stumble upon new sounds without fiddling with a sea of knobs and buttons. We're using neural networks in a novel sort of way. We're using neural networks to generate sound. Not the actual note that's playing, but the sound of the instrument. And one of the first projects we worked on was NSynth, which stands for Neural Synthesizer. The NSynth algorithm learns the core aspects of what makes each sound sound like it does, and then combine those characteristics, drawing a new sound that's not just a blending of the two original sounds. Okay, so the first surprise for me is that NSynth works at all, because it's technically a very complicated algorithm and one that was hard to train. And so we've needed to go from heavy math and big computers and lots of code to something that musicians could play. And so another group at Google, called Creative Lab, took the sounds from Ensynth and created a musical instrument. We call it Ensynth Super. Maybe you want some consumer-level music robotics to play your drum set for you. Don't worry, the PolyN Perk Pro will do that, and unlike you or I, it doesn't get tired or miss a beat. So, I can play with it when it's playing, like...
Or maybe you want to augment your existing favorite instrument like the guitar. The Sensus Smart Guitar runs off its own music operating system called Elk. The hardware and software behind Elk will advance instrument augmentation systems in all sorts of new and creative ways. Just look at this guy shredding away on this thing. And while this could be its own lecture, we've seen the re-emergence of modular synthesis. Don Buchla's brainchild has seen a full comeback, as musicians who are tired of working in the box, staring at a computer screen, reject that system for the comfort of physical hardware again. There's thousands of modules by independent developers being produced now, and they have a common connection system called Eurorack now. Lastly, Max has seen a transformation in recent years with Max for Live. The first time an open programming environment has been embedded inside of a digital audio workstation. Take the coding potential of Max and stick it inside Ableton Live, allowing composers and performers to customize devices, create their own effects and automations, reconfigure connections to controllers, route audio. The possibilities are endless here. Since it works the way Max does, you can drag and drop custom programs directly into Ableton Live. I think we'll see other software companies open up their products as they won't be able to compete with what Live has here. I also like this idea of sharing here because I made the granulator for me anyway, and now it's there. Um, why not sharing it? The granulator is, as the name implies, a granular synthesis-based sample playback instrument. It goes beyond what you could do with normal sampling, and at the same time it does not replace a sampler. I loaded right after this, and this is featuring some of our um, Max for Live drum synths. Now, you notice I don't even have a clip playing here because all the MIDI is going to be generated by the Instant House device. So I'm just going to hit play. And right off the bat, we get a beat. And we have four different drums right here. We see a kick, a snare, hi-hats, percussion. And each one of those is sending out a MIDI note that you can change with these dials. I'm playing around with the kick sound right now. We'll just bring that back down to C1, where my kick actually is. We can also change the pattern. So essentially what's going on here is that each drum sound has a set of 11 different patterns. And there you have it, the history and the future of music tech. I hope you found the video to be informative and maybe even entertaining. See you around.